Right, well, I parked this a bit close. I'm not even sure if I can get in here. I may have to go around the other side. Oh, I think I can. Yep. Right. Well, I'm going to get this out because uh, I want to take it for a drive. I haven't had it out for a while. It's probably the only reason. Let's start it up. That's all, that's all right. Right. Uh, this video is going to be about cars, uh, but... Um, I think it's going to be mentioning a few other things, and I, I would say that if any of you watching are of a disposition to believe in political correctness to the extent that um, <laughs> you join the world of madness, let's put it that way, uh, you probably best not watch this video, because I'm just going to talk about uh, cars and people. Um, without being influenced by the crap that's um, being put out by some people. Right, well the uh, 2CV, uh, which has had the engine, well not rebuilt, but um, almost redesigned, it's, it's got new, new barrels and uh, uh, pistons, so it's had its capacity increase from 6 to, 602 to 650. Um, the uh, and what else do I had to what I had to do to it? Uh, well, I'm having a new. What I'm going to do now is I'm having a new carburetor I bought for it, and that's going to be fitted, and a new starter motor. Well, I wasn't too happy with the starter motor because it's it just doesn't sound right, and the carburetor's got some. It's a it was a reconditioned one years ago, and it's got a flat spot in it. Um, so I, I decided that as I'm spending all this money on the car, that I'll have the uh, those two things fixed as well. Especially considering that you know my wife and I are taking it to Croatia uh, this year, and you know it's sort of three thousand mile round trip or whatever. So uh, I was looking at or thinking about components that could fail on the journey. But the only thing I've, I'm thinking about now is the is the alternator. But uh, I might just buy another one and take it with me. Um, anyway, that's going to go in and have that done, and, and and it's MOT, and then it's sort of uh, all up to spec then and ready to go. I'm still running it in, but anyway, this car is uh, nice. The heat's just sort of blowing in now. Haven't had this out for a few months. Yeah, that looks really nice. I can't get over these cars. They're um. They're such lovely looking cars, and mine is in such good condition, and I've been looking at them on uh, eBay recently, and I've seen, well, from the pictures and everything in the description, they seem to be almost as nice looking as mine, maybe even better, I don't know. They, but they seem certainly good, and, and they fetch no money. Literally, you know, a few thousand pounds you can buy one of these. Absolutely amazing. Why is that? Right, let's park this up for the night. I mean, since the uh, the engine's been done, oh yeah, uh, what he, of course, what he did on this was he fitted a uh, this new coil and new leads, and it's just amazing. It starts so good, absolutely amazing. This car is now. I'm so pleased with it. Right, let's park this up for the night. Right, well that'll just uh, keep the frost off it tonight. Yeah, I'd be uh, really interested to hear from people uh, their points of view as to why these cars are so cheap. I know one thing about them, they are expensive to keep on the road in terms of um, the uh, tax. And this is, I think, £500 a year tax. Probably the insurance isn't uh, too cheap for a lot of people. So maybe that's the reason. But, you know, when you think that you've got such a lovely little sports car here for a few thousand pounds it really looks nice it's different handles pretty well uh, reasonable on fuel I just don't understand it 
Right, well, I wanted to talk about something else, but um, I keep getting diverted. I got diverted on the uh, crossfire here because I don't know why, but I put the flashes on to check the whether all the indicator lights were working, and uh, one wasn't. So this light wasn't working, and uh, also um, when I looked at the um, rear lights, the uh, these were not that yellow because in England here obviously we need them; they need to be yellow and got a white lens. So the orange bulbs had started to fade or whatever. So I decided to get Andy, the electrician, along. He came along last night and uh, checked the bulbs because there's a, two different types of bulbs that they use in this car, apparently, he tells me. Anyway, he figured that out and he's buying a box of bulbs for me. We're going to replace all of them because we found that the orange paint on these bulbs was um, starting to peel off. And uh, the ones on the back were only partly orange now. So they probably wouldn't have uh, passed the uh, MOT here. So that uh, means that I can't drive this at the moment. It's got no indicators. But I am going to take the 2CV to uh, my friend who's going to fit the new carburetor on it, get it MOT'd, and also a new start motor. So this is going to be turned into even more of a new car. So I'm going to have to take this over there now. And we've got the um, muff here. That, that's working well. Keeping the car a little warmer in the cold weather. Right, so I've taken the uh, 2CV over. And uh, the next thing will be to take the Amy over and swap over cars when he's done the 2CV. So I think I'm going to see if I can get this started. Because the last time I tried to start it, it wouldn't start. I think the battery's going to have to be charged for this. So let's have a look. So all the time I've had this car, it's been an extremely slow starter choke on. Um, and I'm hoping that by fitting this new coil, uh, like as the same as we fitted to the 2CV, and some new leads, that it will um, solve that problem. Anyway. Ooh, don't like the sound of that. Right, so we're uh, going to take the Amy over to have a new coil fitted and uh, some new leads and hopefully it will start a bit better. Hopefully it will start today as well. See that bang? Right, I'm going to pick up the, uh, take this in and uh, pick up my 2CV, which has had a new carburetor fitted, a new starter motor, and it's had an MOT, so that should be alright. Right, next stop, um, 2CV Heaven, because it's a really nice place to get your car done with that guy. Right, well, there's the 2CV. Right, well, I've had some work done on the uh, 2CV, well, quite a lot of work, really. I've had the, um, well, first of all, I had the engine done, 
uh, when I mean done, I mean I've had uh, new barrels and new pistons fitted, which have increased the capacity of the engine from 602 to 650. Uh, I've had a new carburetor fitted, and I've had a new starter motor fitted, and had a new coil fitted, uh, which is some really super coil, which uh, really seems to have improved things no end. And new leads uh, from the coil to uh, going down to the uh, to the uh, engine, um, and uh, I had <laughs> two lovely chrome wipers that I like. Um, yeah, so that's quite a lot of work, I think. And also, I've had the uh, car checked again. The brakes have all been looked at, and. Uh, everything else um, so it's looking really good for Croatia the only thing that we uh, well I wondered about was the um, alternator but that's been tested and it's um, putting out the right current at the moment so I guess we'll just leave that and hope for the best it's just that over a 3,000 mile journey when the car doesn't get a lot of constant use I just worry that you know over that period things are going to come to uh, to uh, find us find that we're going to find that there's things wrong with some components, but uh, there isn't many components left now that uh, that can be fixed. And as for the Amy, well, that had a lot of work on it as well a few weeks ago with new kingpins and uh, stainless steel exhaust. And I just had a coil fitted to that, a new coil, and leads, uh, the same ones that I had uh, in the 2CV. And I hope that uh, they will solve the uh, starting problem that I've always had with this car. In fact, uh, they obviously uh, seem to. It obviously seems to work because at the moment the car starts instantly. But the proof's going to be in the uh, pudding of leaving it. So what I intend to do, I brought it back today. Uh, it started instantly when I picked it up. But what I'm going to do now is leave it for a couple of weeks. Um, just leave it here for a couple of weeks. Now, normally, if I leave this car for a couple of weeks, it has difficulty starting. You know, it churns and churns. So we'll see what happens in a few weeks. I'll just leave the car and uh, then I'll take the cover off and we'll we'll see. Obviously the 2CV I'm still trying to run it in so I'm going to be using that quite a bit over the next few weeks try and get sort of really at least well I've got, probably got about 300 miles on it since it since the engine was done but I want to try and get a thousand at least so that um, I get it a bit bedded in. Um, it'll certainly get run in when it goes to Croatia and the Mercedes is still under cover I'm loath to let it be exposed to all the frost and the snow now because it's become a really almost a prized possession now. You know, I've had it and partly because of, of the, the um, rarity of the car that it's this uh, formatic, the original formatic estate, and it and it all works, everything's working, and it was such a high spec uh, example of mine. Um, and I've had it 20 years, so you know, what can I say? But the Crossfire, well, Crossfire is lovely. I've had that out a few times. It's funny, actually, after riding the around in the 2CV for um, a couple of weeks now, since I had the engine done, and that's such a soft, lovely ride, that 2CV. People don't, you know, if people have never had a 2CV, they don't understand, you know, how, uh, how really uh, soft the suspension is on that car. And this thing uh, is really hard. I went on it last night did quite a few miles in it, you know, probably did, oh, I don't know, 30, 35 miles in it, and um, uh, it's a really hard ride, really is uh, quite severe, actually, compared to the 2CV, this is just what you get used to, and obviously what roads you were on, and I was on country roads, and they weren't the smoothest of roads, so that was that, but, uh, you know, the suspension and these uh, very low-profile tyres and everything, you know, it really is um, a much harsher vehicle to ride in. But yeah, lovely, lovely fun. And I, but I, I, the main thing with this, I just love the styling. I, I'm just really attracted to the styling. I think it's just such a beautiful little car. Lovely design. But the thing that really pissed me off, really pissed me off, and it was my fault, all my fault. So I took the Jag out. Uh, a couple of days ago and I wanted to take it for a little ride get get everything lubricated by driving it they let the engine warm up properly and everything and I came back 
and it was starting to rain and everything, I thought, well, I'm going to get the car in as far as I can because the back keeps getting wet. And God knows what I was thinking, but you can guess here, look, suddenly I, I realized I, I must have been looking at this, which is farther back than this, and I just touched the front. And what I did was, I just, there's one there and one there. I, I just nicked into the uh, bodywork there. Well, you can imagine I was really upset with that. I didn't sleep. <laughs> That's really upset me. So anyway, I'm going to take that into the body shop uh, later on in the week maybe and book that in to get it done. I just <laughs> really annoys me. Actually, while I get those done, I'll see if there's any other little imperfections of which I can hardly find any. I think there were a couple of stone chips maybe on the bonnet and I'll get them to uh, see if they can do something with that. Um, also, I can put a bit of paint on this parking sensor here which hasn't got any paint on it. I have got some paint actually, I was going to do it, but I'll get them to do that. Well, that, that drives me mad, that little bit of white there. So, that's really pissed me off that I did that because I had car hadn't got a mark on it. And it's such a nice car, this. I mean, it's a lovely environment to be in. Just one of these cars that you uh, enjoy coming in and sitting. And, and, and there we go. You know, this is uh, one of the things I was going to talk about. And it's a difficult thing to, uh, to uh, really get across. And uh, I'm not even sure if I'm going to be able to manage it. But I kind of, uh, when I was a kid at school, we used to have this. So you'd, you would do that. I don't know if you can see that, like a stick man, and that was a head and arms and legs, and that was a man, you put little things, that was a man, sometimes we used to play uh, hangman's noose, you know, that, that game, that was a man, and, and then there'd be another one where you'd do a circle and uh, line down and arms, and you'd put a dress on it, you know, so a little skirt sort of thing. And that was a woman. And there were only two sexes, right? There were two sexes. And if you... You wouldn't put a dress on that one, because that, in my mind, would become a man now, and that's a woman. Ah, oh, anyway. So, the thing is, I think about cars and uh, in relation to men and women. And I think it's very interesting, because cars have only been around for, the, I mean, if I say a hundred years, that's, you know, we're, we're around the, 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 in the length of span of how long man's been on, on this planet. I mean, a hundred years is about what we're talking about with motor cars, um, in, in, in the form that we really know them. I mean, I know, you know, they started maybe a bit longer than that with carriages with little engines in them, but I'm talking about cars as we understand them. We sort of really started after the Second World War. Um, but anyway, so we talk about a hundred years, but the attachment uh, that men have with cars, the relationship that men have with cars, is is profound. It's very very strong, um, and it's uh, it's across a lot of uh, different um, groups of men. I mean, different countries. There's, you know, you can go to America, you go to Canada, Australia, especially in many of the Western countries, and. You can talk to these people about cars, um, and and they'll you can have the enjoy and um, the same conversation. And you know you go to somewhere like Sweden, and they've got a massive um, group of people in Sweden that uh, love American cars. They love English cars in Germany. They love English cars France, and, and it just goes on and on. And predominantly, it's men. Now. This has developed over the last, I don't know, 40 years into this uh, movement now that's known as classic cars. It's become a hobby. It, it is a hobby, the hobby of classic cars. Now, when I first started into uh, getting involved in cars, um, I was young. And... Uh, the cars that were around that were we thought were old and classics were either veteran cars, vintage cars, 
or the sort of cars from the 30s. Or the, the, we should think of the English sports car, you know, the the, uh, L, the old MGs and Morgan type cars. Um, but classic cars now have evolved into a situ uh, into a into a class of their own. It's all cars. Basically, any car that isn't new is a, is a classic. Um, and I don't actually agree with this. I mean, you could be struggling now to say that this car is a, is a modern classic. And the word modern has been injected because it isn't really an old car. But it is an old car in a way. Uh, actually, that's what it is. It's an old car. And that's the point that I, I, I kind of make. So there's two things that I was really talking about. Uh, and this is going to go off topic really, but it's that there's old cars and there's a reason that men are have a relationship with cars and especially old cars. So, first of all, I think that um, the classic car, uh, the classic cars doesn't really mean anything anymore. To me, it's just a name. Uh, for a hobby, and that is the hobby of uh, owning and running and maintaining and trying to keep going older cars. Uh, a new car now you buy is a fantastic, uh, fantastic vehicle. Uh, it's most new cars perform really well, and they're looked after by garages. But they have a very limited life. Their life is as long as the garage is able to maintain them, uh, plug them in, and replace. Uh, sort out, in fact, isolate why something goes wrong if it does, when it usually does, and to uh, put it right by putting in new components. Now, once you can't diagnose the car properly, and you, and or you can't replace that um, a, a failed uh, component, then the car isn't anything. It's just a it's just a, a collection of metal and glass and everything. And I found that out, for example, with many cars, and especially lately with my Volvo XC90, which I really loved, and it was a lovely car. But I had to dump it in the end because basically it gave it away because um, nobody could keep it going. And, and, you know, you just can't keep cars going now when they're not right. They have to be almost 100% right, or they won't pass the legislation, uh, the tests, uh, the, uh, the vehicle tests that you you. you you have to comply with, and um, and then you can't drive them. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can't keep an old car now that isn't working as it was when it was new. But older cars are easier to maintain because there's less to go wrong with them, less electronic um, indications that there is anything wrong. Uh, so, in fact, you could have a lot of things wrong with an old car, but there's no warning lights and, or, or anything to tell you that there is. So, you know, it, it can pass a test, perhaps. Um, but it is easier to keep old cars going. So why, why do men have this fascination with older cars? And it is mainly men. And, you know, when I draw this little matchstick thing, what I was trying to prove was, when I was young, there were two genders. There were men and women. And men and women were different. And the men were different from the women in the little stick drawing because the women had a skirt. So there was a difference. That was the only difference. And when it comes to other things in life, men have this affinity with uh, motor cars. And, you know, generally speaking, women don't. They have an affinity with... Um, an emotional um, relationship with animals, with um, with uh, any. Well, I say it's not really even animals. Actually, it's it's the vulnerability within animals. So, a, you know, a cute little um, a donkey uh, or a rabbit with big eyes you know, that needs care. Um, a woman is naturally drawn to that. And it's true, regardless of, uh, you know, the people that come and say t and try to tell you, or they tell me, then let's leave it personal, they tell me, oh, you know, that you're being, I'm being sexist, no, no, no. You know, no, actually, that's what women are evolved into being, because they have more nurturing and caring hardwired into them than men do. But that's not to say that women don't have affinity with machines and cars. Of course they do, just like men have caring and nurturing um, 
feelings and emotions in them as well. But predominantly, women have more. And when it comes to vehicles, so why, why do men have an affinity with vehicles? Because, first of all, I think uh, one of the things with cars that I think is interesting is that, that it, it, it's something that binds men together. Before we had cars, what used to bind men, make them be able to bond? Common interests, common interests in fighting, in wars, in in weapons, in uh, horses, and, and in in games, and, and you know, men. You have to have some reason, something in common. And cars, I think, give to men what perhaps looking after children, caring for animals, so on, do for women. So let's forget about women before I get into trouble. I've talked to so many men about cars. I've read car magazines since I was a kid in the 50s, and uh, you know I've read hours and hours of it. I've spoken for hours and hours. Um, I've been involved with classic cars, or old cars, as I really would like to keep calling them. I've had older cars almost all my adult life. Um, I've had new cars as well, uh, but I've had old cars almost all my a adult life, and um, cars, and it is a nurturing, it is a caring emotion because we want to maintain these cars, we want to bring them back from the dead almost, we want to bring them back to life, um, and and keep them alive, and uh, they have they they have a, a, a life of their own. This car has this. It it becomes a living, breathing um, being almost. Uh, a ludicrous situation uh, when you talk to women, mostly, and and ex try to explain that. Um, but from my point of view, my perspective, it's true. And uh, you know, getting parts, getting it fixed, spending money on it, doing that, or doing it yourself, whatever. It's just part of the process of keeping and maintaining the car, which is, in to me, the, the, the I think that's the primary pleasure I get out of the car. Then there's the pride of ownership, obviously, um, the actual love and joy that you see um, just from the shape of the car, because obviously different types of cars... Um, uh, attract or attract different people, or you're attracted to it like we are attracted to women. Um, different women were attracted to many different things individually, and you know what beauty is in the eye of the beholder, as as the saying goes. And I think that's certainly true with cars. But also, cars are um, a reflection of, in many cases as well, your. Uh, your, your, your sort of lifestyle or, or how you see yourself in, in, in this, this massive world. I mean, some people like speed, they like sports cars, they like power. Other people, like myself, I like big limousines. I like the, I do like, I think, all the cars, like my Jag. I prefer a big limo type car. Um, some people like this, like these little quirky cars. There's a lot of guys on YouTube who um, have micro cars and they do fantastic uh, videos on these cars um, and it's funny that how you know different vehicles attract or people are attracted to different types of vehicles um, so what am I really saying a lot of a, a lot to do with cars that actually that relate to men and I I do believe that the, the, the this love of mechanical objects that men primar primarily have is almost the same drive that women have, or the emotional drive that women have when they are driven to care for vulnerable creatures. So to a woman, I think it's, it's got to be alive, you know, and a, a vulnerable creature, a woman is drawn to care for that creature. And with a man, generally, I think it's a vulnerable machine. 
It is. An old car is a vulnerable machine that needs care and attention. But we've got into this situation, i come back now to this business of classics. What is a classic? Um, a classic really is any old car, and an old car that's gone beyond the point where it is a new one. And when, when does that point arrive? Well, it arrives fairly quickly now. You know, we're looking at cars that are 10 years old now, and in the classic magazines and the classic world, 10-year-old cars are modern classics. So they become old cars. And in actual fact, there can be some logic in that, because to keep a car on the road that's 10 years old can be a bit of a hassle now. It can be almost an impossibility, or extremely difficult, um, because the main dealers... You know, once a car reaches maybe, I don't know, six, seven years old, they don't really want to know. Um, you know, I find that with uh, a lot of the cars I've had, they know nothing about them, and they certainly don't seem to want to um, work on them because they're not of any interest to them now. The technology has advanced in that eight to ten years, and uh, the parts availability is no longer there, necessarily. So... I don't think a lot of this is actually making much sense. Um, I just feel so strongly that uh, there is such um, a feeling that men have with cars that's so deep. And it's as deep and as important as women who generally are the ones that have the emotional caring instinct but I think men have the same caring instinct but they have it directed at in the moment in history on cars I mean obviously it wasn't always cars and I think the same feeling has always been there I think the camaraderie with men who uh, through the centuries have got together, you know, as I say, with fighting or with weapons, um, common interest in the sea, sailors, their work, fishermen, miner, any, my, anyone. That's how men are, I think. And cars are just another example. So this is an absolutely crazy uh, video. It must have caught me in a strange mood. But um, I think I'll leave it there. This scooter, I mean, I've had uh, nothing but electrical uh, issues with it uh, in the couple of years now that I've had it. Um, the latest one was the uh, stoplight uh, didn't work. That's the light there, so that's the tail light, and that's the stoplight. And it works off of the... Um, there's a switch on the foot pedal, foot brake, that's the foot brake. So down in there is a switch. Anyway, after cleaning the uh, switch out, um, taking the switch out, uh, actually taking it apart and cleaning it all, um, all the contact points and everything, uh, we got it working all right. So obviously, I suspect it's probably because this thing's just sitting out here not getting enough use, because it was working, but uh, now it is working. But of course I have had issues where the, uh, when I had it in for its first MOT, the side light wasn't wired up and then the horn wasn't working. So gradually we've um, cured all of those problems. And the other problem I had with lights was with the crossfire. So last week I discovered that um, these two tail lights, so that the indicator lights rather, which have got a white glass and then they've got an orange bulb, they were not really very orange. Um, also, uh, one of the uh, indicator lights in the front, had, the bulb had failed. That was this one, up in there. So Andy came over and uh, we had a look at the bulbs and discovered that uh, the orange on them was flaking off everywhere. Let's have a look. Right, so there's a um, proper bulb. But actually, the bulbs that we had, uh, that we took out, uh, they were um, nothing like this. They were flaking off everywhere. In fact, uh, we, we throw them away now. But if you just rub them like that, all the uh, orange 
uh, was just coming off the glass. Um, quite unbelievable, really. That was uh, both of these two here, and the ones in the front weren't much better, so we, we, we changed the, uh, the lot of them, put new bulbs in all round. Um, I've not really noticed that before because the Mercedes has got uh, a white lens in the front. This was there, and that's got orange bulbs. I've never noticed that one having a problem before. But uh, this this one, maybe the bulbs that the guy had before in it, whoever put them in in the beginning, were some cheapo bulb. I don't know. But anyway, we replace those, so that'll be all right. Right, okay, we're going to give this a better trial. I've um, been sitting here now for about a week, and uh, this is the first time I'm really going to try it for how its cold starting is working with the new coil. So we'll see. Uh, it's had some cold weather. Now, full choke. We'll just try it now, if I can get the uh, steering lock, oops, sorry about that, the steering lock to clear. Right, well that's uh, certainly better than it's ever been. It's as instant as you could probably expect. Uh, choke in a bit. So the choke's in halfway, really. It feels quite smooth at the moment. Certainly not lumpy or anything. But being uh, cold, yeah, not bad at all. So I think we'll take it out. Right, right. Well, it's uh, it's, it's been um, about ten days, I think. So I'm going to finally just pull the cover off this and see if it'll start. Now, it's um, it's had that new uh, coil. And uh, leads, and I'm hoping that it's going to uh, start better. Now, up until this point, I might have tried this, but it wouldn't have started. Right, okay, let's have a look. Now, as I say, up until, uh, well, all the time I've had this car, um, it's never been a good starter. So, it's now had a uh, new coil, new leads, and a non-return valve on the carburetor. So, um, God, I'm hoping this works. <laughs> right, it's got the full choke, and uh, we will... Uh, I'm not going to pump it, I'm just going to turn the key, see what happens. No, I can't do that, I'm going to have to put my foot down a little bit, I just, it just can't help with the clutch in here. Right, see what happens. Well, they're fired. <laughs> Oops, the radio. No, now, that's not that exciting. I've got the choke out, haven't I? I'll put the choke back in a bit. Uh, I won't touch the throttle. That's not a good sign. Hmm. Right now, I'm pumping it. Well, um, I don't know what to make of that. First of all, that isn't starting instantly like the uh, two CV is, um, but. It's starting better than it had had uh, been starting in the past. I've got the choke right in now. So, I don't know what to make of it. I mean, at least it started. <laughs> well, but it, I was hoping it was going to be as instant as the 2CV. So, I don't know what to say. I'm lost for words now. I had expected that to be instant. Um, well, okay. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. I think I'll leave it and try it again in, the, in another week. See what happens. 
let it run for a bit, I think, and uh, call it a day. But anyway, my wife's um, um, given me some instructions. I've got to look at her car because um, she has it cleaned, uh, has it washed. <laughs> she doesn't wash it, and she doesn't ask me to do it. I've got too many cars to wash. So she has it washed at a local car wash place, you know, one of these ones where you pull in and about 50 guys come out and clean it in five seconds. So she just had it done and she was pleased with it. She wanted me to have a look at it. I'll go do that now. Right, well, there's my wife's Volvo, and uh, yeah, it looks great. Um, yeah, beautiful. To clean the wheels nice as well. It looks like a new car, doesn't it? I think that. Uh, I'm going to take the Jag in next week and have them do that. Yeah, they do the inside good as well, clean all the mats. That's lovely. Okay, so now I know I'll take mine in next week. We'll have a look and see what they do with the Jag. And I think the Aventine could do with a, a, a little bit of a professional clean-up. Um, yeah, try that. Right, before I finish, um, I think we'll just have a little look here because we're getting to the stage here where we're um, going to be putting the scaffolding up another lift and uh, we're getting close to getting the uh, point where the, the, the roof um, trusses start going on. So we've got the, um, the joists down here for the on the first floor. So behind here, where they've covered it up the other day, this is all brickwork. It's all face brickwork that's there. Um, where the blocks are, that's uh, there's going to be cladding on there, like timber cladding. So there's a joist going up and then that steel, that steel is actually the height of the, just underneath that will take the roof, so that's near the roof it's about as high as the building will be but a bit higher than where that block is, we, we get up to the point where the uh, the roof trusses sit on well it's actually got to come up a bit higher much higher than that I guess they've been working on that party wall there, filling all that in and there's a doorway there that's been filled in and you can see the shape of the original building this is a porch in here this will be a porch and uh, we'll have a toilet, a little toilet WC in the as you go in This will be clad. Nice evening. So it's coming on. Yes, <laughs> I think we'll. Uh, I think we'll take this in for a clean. We'll uh, let this have a valet next week. I'll take that in and see what they can do with that. That should look nice. Uh, all cleaned up. Looks nice now, I think. Okay, that's it. Hello. How are you?